Hello. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we will outline certain best practices for verification and validation and discuss how these practices can help you in your engineering design tasks. Um, these are practices which uh, our customers have employed and have gained benefit from. With that said, please let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nishat Wasi. I'm a product marketing manager for model verification and validation products. With me today, I have uh, Jay. Uh, thanks, Nishat. Uh, yeah, this is Jay. Um, I uh, am also a product marketing manager with a responsibility for MathWorks uh, code verification products, and uh, we're very excited to have you join us. And um, we'll go through uh, this particular webinar discussing best practices for verification and validation. So we're back to you, Nishan. Thank you, Jay. Um, so why should you uh, involve yourself in these best practices, or how can this verification and validation process help you? Right? One large factor where VNV can help you is cost. So on this slide, we have a survey. And the results of a survey which we did for a bunch of our aerospace customers, this is real data. And uh, what this slide depicts is there's a huge cost saving, uh, namely 62% cost saving uh, in using model-based design. If I can draw your attention to two parts over here, um, that is the requirements and the testing phases of your design, that's where the maximum benefit of verification and validation is. And this is, again, what our aerospace customers uh, have seen. And this study on um, ROI uh, has proved as well. So definitely a lot of cost saving possible on the requirements and testing side. And uh, we'll go on to discuss how that is possible. Um, what we intend to do today is um, use this design we. This is a simplified version of a typical design description environment. Uh, on the top left, we have our requirements where you start your design. And on the top right, you have uh, your actual end product. In between, there are various stages to the design. The, that could be developing an algorithm, creating C, C++, ADA code from that algorithm, doing integration work, uh, testing this at a model and code level, et cetera. So we will keep this design we in perspective throughout our presentation. And we'll try, Jay and I will connect to this uh, at uh, every point we can. So what are these best practices I'm talking about? Uh, we intend to cover four, uh, first being simulation, executing your uh, design specifications. Second is uh, tracking any changes in your design and requirements through requirements traceability analysis. Uh, third is finding untested portions of your design through model coverage. And uh, lastly, formal verification methods to mathematically prove the absence of errors in your design. Again, uh, on the right-hand side, I have that design V, a simplified version of it. And uh, we'll try connecting to each point uh, on this V as we go on. So to start at a model level, uh, it's absolutely essential uh, to perform simulations. I mean, the whole point and the value of model-based design is through these simulations. Let me jump into a demo to show you more. What I have here is uh, I was tasked with creating a fuel rate controller for basically an engine, right? Uh, what I have here is a system level model which has my controller over here under fuel sys and uh, my plant, which is the engine dynamics. I have my entire system set up such that the controller keeps getting validated with the engine dynamics. The actual, uh, the actual outputs are, keep, are fed back in a closed loop, as you can see over here. So what, what does this uh, system do? What it does is it, it gives me, the controller gives me a particular amount of fuel which, the, which is input into the engine. And at the output of the engine, I measure the air to fuel mixture and feed that back into my control algorithm. Um, so this is nothing but an executable specification. I can go ahead, I can run this. Uh, that's the core value of having a model-based design. What I have here is uh, on my controller, I have a set of sensory inputs. I can 
toggle certain failure modes if I need to. I can see uh, particular speed ranges through simulation. Again, I'm trying to exercise my model as best I can with how many ever scenarios possible. Right? And that's the uh, entire value of uh, performing this verification step. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to log certain signals. So I'm going to log the metered fuel output of a controller. And I'm also going to log um, the ratio, the, the ratio of my air to fuel mixture at the end of my, um, my, my plant. So a key part of simulation is uh, having the capability of logging these inputs and inspecting the signals in simulation. So what I'm doing is I'm bringing up a viewer, a signal viewer, if I may call it that. Uh, I'm going to record my logged values, and I'm going to view that in the viewer. So say I, I start simulation. I, I have a particular run. Um, I want to now change the nominal speed input to my engine and again rerun my simulation, what my logged window does is it captures these runs, right? I'm going to maximize this. And um, if you, okay, as you can see, I had two runs, uh, namely run one and run two, which I have logged within my uh, this Simulink Data Inspector. And these are the two signals which I was logging in both the runs. Uh, this is a nice way of viewing the signals. On the right, these signals can get plotted. You can view as many as you want. You can compare uh, your signals which you have logged against uh, two simulation runs. So say I want to compare the outputs of uh, the first run with the second one, right? When uh, I had a nominal speed input and I had a high speed input, I can do that comparison quite easily and uh, have the plot show up in terms of what is what was what were the signals, what is the difference, what is the tolerance value between the two signal runs. Now. Uh, another common task is you've created your sig you've created your simulations. Uh, I mean, you've created your entire system, your plant model controller. Um, you may also want to bring in some of the expected outputs. So uh, Simulink allows you to do that. I'm doing file import. In my particular case, I have a mat file. Uh, basically, I have data stored. Uh, in terms of expected outputs, I know that I want, I'm interested in these two particular log values, and I am getting an expected output, uh, which I had pre-saved in a mat file. This could be, you can import this from an Excel file, any empirical data which you may have, basically get this expected value in and see how this compares against your simulation runs. I'm gonna hit okay, and um, you will notice that there's a third run which was populated over here going to zoom in here, which says imported data. And I'm going to compare now my first run, that's my first simulation run, against uh, any imported data. As you can see, uh, this gives me a great way of validating whether my uh, system behaves as expected against its expected values, and so on. Um, so this, again, the key part is simulation. Um, using or simulating your system uh, with all the possible test scenarios. Sometimes you can use test scenarios which might not be stable or uh, you cannot use them on your actual hardware. Simulation provides you, uh, of course, with that benefit. With that said, I'm going to come back uh, to my presentation. Uh, a brief recap, you can model linear and nonlinear systems within Simulink. Uh, Test these, basically stimulate it with any input vectors which you desire, bring it in from outside, uh, and analyze the results. So the key is having an executable specification in that case, which helps you uh, compare and uh, contrast your different runs. Um, moving on, the next best practice is tracking changes in your design. You know, uh, If you're involved with any engineering design task, usually things change. Nothing is set in stone, however much we may like it. And uh, 
tracking these changes and trying to manage these changes as best as possible can save a lot of time, energy. Um, Simulink verification and validation is a product within our Simulink suite, which allows you to link any model element or state flow chart to particular lines of uh, requirements outside of the Simulink environment. So you can link anything from within Simulink to an external requirement document. Now, you can not only link from Simulink to that document, but you can link backwards as well. So you can have a link which goes from that external requirements document back into Simulink. This is useful because you can track any uh, requirement change, and I'll show you how in just a minute. I'm going to escape out of this, um, come back to my MATLAB environment. What I had uh, earlier shown you was an entire system model with a plant and controller. I'm going to click into the controller model. As you can see here, this is uh, the basic logic, which is a state flow chart under the hood, uh, which is running my controller. I, in, in the interest of time, I have linked uh, parts of this model with an external requirement document. Uh, it's very easy to highlight these links. Uh, let me zoom in here. Under the Tools menu, I had a Requirements option. And these are a bunch of options which come with this Requirements Traceability feature, which we uh, have in Simulink Verification and Validation. I'm going to go ahead and highlight my model so what this will do is um, it will and go through my model and figure out what parts of it have a requirement associated with it. Every part which has a requirement associated is uh, highlighted in orange, uh, as you can see over here. So for example, this throttle input port, if I were to, you know, if, if someone were to ask me in a shot, what is this link to? I right click, go to requirements, and if I hit throttle sensor, what this does is it brings up my requirements. In this case, my requirements document is a Microsoft Word uh, document. And uh, it actually goes and links. It's, it, go, it opens this document up if it was not open for you. And it would highlight that particular requirement, which I have associated by linking it uh, to any model element. Now, in this particular case, I can um, link backward as well. That is an option which I uh, have enabled. It's up to you if you do not want to modify your requirements document, which certain customers do do not. They do not want to touch their document. You can um, have just a one directional or unidirectional link. So in this case, uh, I could link back as well. Uh, as you can see, another requirement was linked to my uh, input port called MAP. Uh, I can have multiple linkages within the same document, so multiple links going to and from uh, an external document to the Simulink environment. So, Nishad, if I could interrupt you for, for a moment. Uh, so, what external documents can you connect an element of a model to? Uh, for example, you showed uh, MS Word in this particular case. Uh, what uh, you know, are the other supported documents? So that's a great question, Jay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, out of the box, uh, Simulink verification validation uh, can support uh, MS Office, that's Microsoft Word, Excel, uh, and other things. It also supports uh, certain requirements management interfaces like doors, IBM Rational Doors. Um, and we provide an API. So if you had um, a new type of document, if you had something called J.ABC, uh, which ABC is your custom document type, mm -hmm. we can provide, uh, you can use this API to link to any custom document type as well. Nice. Uh, it's easy enough to do. Great, thank you. Thanks, Jay. Um, let's go back to the slides. I have another example, which I'm going to do through Slideware. Um, what I have here is a particular state flow chart. I have a particular element within that, which I have linked to an external doors requirement, right? Um, this is quite easy to achieve, very similar to what uh, I was showcasing with Microsoft Office. Now, the requirement traceability gives you an option um, to export your model structure into the doors environment. So if you are interested uh, in having a traceability matrix, this is possible using this tool. I have exported my uh, model into the doors requ uh, requirement infrastructure over here. Uh, sorry, the management interface. 
Um, now, this is useful because what if something were to change, right? What if a requirement, a customer says that, no, you know what, Nishad, I don't want a 0.6 over here. Um, I, I don't want a 0.5, which was my original uh, requirement specification. I want to change this value to 0.6, right? Now, here's where the requirement traceability really is effective and can help you because you have the model structure already exported in a traceability view, or even so, you can just simply click on that requirement, which has changed, and navigate to a model element. So that is definitely useful. Uh, my next step would be to create a new version of this model, make that change which, was, uh, which the customer asked me to make, and create a new version. I'm calling that version 1.1. Now, the cool part is, uh, if I had this traceability view, I could also have that requirement associated with test plans, right? Which ever so hap uh, often happens. And using traceability in this test plans, I can trace which particular test case is going to be affected by a requirement change. So I can go back into my test case scenarios, which are I have designed in Simulink, and trace back to the test case which I need to rerun to validate whether my requirement uh, did not create issues within the model. So I can, instead of going and running uh, the entire battery of tests again, I can be very specific and figure out uh, what test should change, what test has changed, and go and uh, uh, only revisit that topic. Um, quickly, uh, another thing is uh, comparing these versions. Since I compared these two, uh, since I created a new version of a model, uh, configuration management sometimes requires me to compare these two versions, tell me what changed, and uh, we have the capability to do that as well. You can merge any model changes. Uh, this is possible because we use uh, an XML file comparison, and uh, you can merge uh, changes which you may have made. Again, the, the reports which, are, which could be generated can be used for uh, configuration management artifact reporting, uh, which are useful in certain standards and uh, certifying code for certain standards. Um, so, Jay, did I, do you think I missed anything? Or, well, so, uh, yeah, there was one kind of follow-up question I guess I had. Um, so it's great to see the um, traceability uh, capabilities there, but what about um, you know, reporting capabilities, uh, especially, I think, you know, for in high-integrity systems uh, for certification purposes, it might be necessary to, to generate artifacts and reports that you can submit to you know, various certification authorities. Okay. Again, that's a great question, Jay. Um, so I, I didn't show that in my demonstration, but uh, yes, we have the capability to generate reports, of requirements traceability reports, where you can link. Uh, I mean, it shows you all the link information mm -hmm. for a particular model. Uh, it also builds or drags the description of the requirement into this report. So you could use that report for uh, certification. And yes, our customers have been doing that. All right, great. Thanks, Thanks. Jay. Um, so moving on, um, the the third thing which I wanted to touch on, on the model side, again, we, we're still on the model verification side, is coverage analysis and how uh, this coverage analysis can help you identify um, parts of your model which are untested or are unexecuted. So uh, again, Simulink verification validation provides uh, this functionality to dynamically collect this uh, information, to dynamically figure out what branch, what branches in your state flow charts, what conditions, what logic, uh, what parts of your Simulink model are going to be executed during simulation. Uh, you can view the results either through an HTML report. Uh, as Jay was saying, this, is, this could be used as an artifact as well. Or you can view the results of this coverage on the model itself. So there is a, you can highlight the model with this coverage information. This gives me an idea and insight as to what parts of the model uh, were covered or will be executed during simulation and what will not. Um, let me dig into a demo to show you uh, what that looks like. So I'm going to clear my system. Um, now, what I'm going to bring up is basically the, the same controller, 
which we uh, we showed you before the state flow chart which is controlling the fuel systems control logic basically the fuel rate controller and um, what what i can do is i can generate a, a harness model to test this controller for model coverage so i'm going to do sl Okay, so uh, a simple command uh, command line API exists. You can do it uh, via the GUI as well. Um, what this command would do is create a harness model. What this is is nothing but it copies or basically refers the actual test unit, which was my state flow chart, into a separate model. Uh, and what it drives it with is a, a set of inputs. Right now, by default, these inputs are zero. Now, if I were to test my model, I would, uh, I would maybe have these test inputs from my requirements. Right? I mean, it could be my requirements or my test plan would have a certain set of uh, test vectors, or maybe I had this from a previous uh, model which I developed, and I want to bring in those test vectors. So that's possible in this uh, signal builder. What, what I'm doing is I'm browsing uh, to a particular Excel file where I st have stored my test vectors. I can bring in the data from that uh, Excel file which will drive my model. Right. So what I'm doing is I'm selecting all my data and I am going to insert that into my signal build. As you can see, there were four groups of data which I had in Excel, and I was able to bring that in. Now, I can... Okay. I can analyze the model coverage uh, for this particular test. Uh, for that, we have a bunch of options. I will not go into details about these options, but uh, you... It, Right now, I'm interested in decision condition and modified condition decision coverage uh, for the particular uh, test model. I want to display the results of the model coverage on, uh, on the model itself. And I want to save the data. Okay. So with that said, I will go into my signal my signal builder and run all uh, the test input cases. Okay. So what this did was it brought up an HTML report which says, uh, okay, in my particular test unit, what parts of the model were covered, what was not, what is the amount of decision, condition, and MCDC coverage? Uh, available. Um, it highlights uh, parts in red where it found that uh, uh, this particular transition, which I'm talking about here, speed greater than max speed, it has links as well to the state flow chart. Uh, so it tells you which transition it's talking about. In this case, it's this particular one. And it tells me a little bit more about the coverage associated with it. Now, um, <clears throat> so let me zoom out. Again, this uh, this information I highlighted on my model, so uh, it's not. You can see that the greens indicate things which were covered. The red uh, is basically uh, transitions which were not executed during my uh, simulation run of all these test cases. So I had a bunch of test cases, uh, and you know I I go I study how much the mo how much of the model was untested. Now I can use formal methods or uh, formal techniques to figure out what other test cases are there which would test the other currently untested portions of my design, right? Um, in order to do this, what I can do is I can build on these test cases which I already have. Let me close this out. Um, I'm going to save the results of uh, the existing coverage results which I had for that particular model, right? Because I want to reuse that and uh, make something of that. OK. 
Okay. Um, so Simulink Design Verifier is another uh, product within the Simulink product family. Uh, what this does is it allows you to generate tests to, uh, to achieve full coverage or uh, it'll use formal methods under the hood uh, to figure out what parts of the model are uncovered and uh, try to create tests for you, automatically generate these test vectors for you. So let me expand this configuration dialog. I have a bunch of options uh, I can generate tests for. Again, this is automatic test generation at a model level. Um, there, in terms of existing coverage, I mentioned that we want to reuse the the functional test cases which we already have. So what I'm doing is I'm bringing in this file which we saved earlier, and I'm asking the tool to reuse or basically extend coverage based on this uh, initial coverage results. So going back here, and I'm going to generate tests. This may take a couple of moments, uh, but the general idea is uh, these tests can be you know, once you have these auto-generated tests, you'd have a better idea of what parts of your model are fully functional or fully used in the design. You could reuse these test cases even later on at a code level. So it's uh, it's simple to do that. So, okay, so it's done. The analysis is done. What, what this uh, analysis did was it created a new model, right? It created a new model with uh, a set of test inputs Right. Uh, in this case, I believe there are 20 odd test cases, 22 test cases. And what I wish to do now is combine these test inputs with the one ones which I had earlier. So I'm going back to my uh, window, command window over here. And what I'm doing is I am merging the two harness models uh, which I which were created for me. Um, okay, if I am to bring up my original harness model, the one which I started off first with, you'd see that my four test cases are still there, and to that I have appended all my auto-generated test result test cases. Um, now, if I were to run this. Uh, this model, I want to see what the coverage results are for uh, all my test inputs. So I guess while this is running, question is, um, you know, it's great that we can automatically generate these test cases, combine them with the test cases we already have. Could we then use this in other type of, say, software in the loop or process in the loop type testing as well when we get to code? Yes, actually, uh, uh, our customers use this often for Soften the loop, as you mentioned, Jay, and uh, even processor in the loop. Uh, absolutely, these are, these test cases can be reused uh, as and when possible, um, and this can save a lot of the money, which we talked about earlier on. The large amount of saving in testing is largely because you can reuse uh, these test cases. So I wouldn't have to necessarily go out and generate additional test cases. I could I could leverage the work that's already done uh, while de de developing the model itself. Yep. Mm. Yep. Great. Well, thanks, Jay. Um, so the coverage analysis is done. As you can see, uh, a high degree of coverage has been achieved. Although it's not 100% coverage, um, a quick view of the model. Actually, let me switch into the model. As you can see, the state flow chart is, uh, is highlighted. Uh, we have a coverage box over here, which tells me a little bit about my conditions. I'm going to zoom in on certain transitions. So as you can see in this state, the coverage information was uh, has been reflected on my entire model. And in this particular state, uh, the analysis tells me that, OK, I have 100% decision, uh, condition 75%. And if I were to click on uh, any transition in red, which is telling me that that's not full coverage, uh, the tool tells me uh, it has full decision co coverage, but not condition. Because this particular condition, pressure less than zero threshold, is never going to be false. So uh, what this tells me is, OK, uh, the way I have designed my system, this condition is never going to occur. Do I actually need this condition for this transition? 
or have I over specified my requirements to come to this point or am I missing something in my requirements? This begs the question for me to go back to my requirements document to see have I missed anything uh, and proceed from there. Um, with that said, I'm going to come back over here to presentation mode. Uh, this is just a quick recap. What we did was we imported a manual test inputs. Uh, we appended these tests with uh, with tests which we auto generate. The Simulink Design Verifier tool generates for you. Uh, this is done using formal methods, and then we tested for model coverage uh, to figure out did we miss anything, uh, are there any missing requirements, etc. So that was the general workflow. Um, and as uh, Jay mentioned, uh, the, we could use uh, software in the loop as well. So we could reuse these test cases uh, for software in the loop testing to check uh, whether my model and generated code align up correctly and uh, everything's fine. Okay, um, so this brings us to our fourth best practice, which is formal methods uh, using uh, mathematical techniques to prove the absence of errors. Um, so at a model level, again, I'm still at a model level, uh, we can use uh, Simulink Design Verify as a tool which uh, can automatically identify uh, certain errors like dead logic, division by zero, integer overflows. It can find these errors at a model level itself and reflect these uh, through color-coded results on the model. So the green uh, indicates uh, parts of your model which are fine, and the red indicates um, possible overflow conditions. Uh, in this particular case, it's an overflow condition, but it could be uh, dead logic, division by zero, et cetera. Uh, again, it uses basically abstraction techniques uh, to figure out, these are formal techniques to figure out uh, if your model behaves as expected. Um, so with that said, um, Coming back to this V over here, um, so Jay, what do you think that is this uh, all that is needed? You know, this model verification which I've shown so far. Uh, yeah, so that's a that's a great lead-in. Um, so you know, as as Nishad has shown, you know, there are various techniques that we can apply at the model level um, to you know ensure that you get to a very robust design that conforms to specifications. But at some point, you have to get to code. Uh, and uh, once you get to code, depending on uh, the type of uh, system you're developing, uh, various types of verification uh, activities are needed to ensure that the code is also correct and robust. So this gets to uh, you know the bottom and the right-hand side of the V model that we have here in on this slide. Now, for the for the code generation aspect, we've got the embedded code of products that can generate production quality code. And then once you uh, are ready to, to verify the code, you get into the uh, code verification uh, tasks on the, on the various code components that you have. So um, you can also apply formal methods on the code using uh, static code analysis techniques uh, to ensure that the code is robust. Uh, and these techniques are actually very powerful. So once you get into code, you're looking at code that has um, algorithms. Um, there might be computations. There might be array accesses and so forth. And using these formal methods-based static code analysis techniques, you can actually uh, prove that your code, for example, will never overflow when you have that operation uh, C equals A plus B. If you have uh, arrays and you're accessing those arrays, again, you can ensure that uh, the accesses to those arrays will always be within the array bounds. If you're doing any type of pointer manipulation with your C code, again, you can ensure that there will never be an illegal dereference causing the program to crash. And then especially when you get into complex mathematical algorithms that have computations with multiplies, additions, divides, and so forth, this is where you would need to, to ensure that uh, you wouldn't have divide by zero conditions, overflows, underflows, and so forth. And again, these, these type of techniques uh, can actually prove that these type of bugs do not exist in your code. So to assist with that, uh, the MathWorks has a product called Polyspace. And Polyspace is a formal methods-based static code analysis tool. And it can help you exhaustively to verify your code. 
and uh, it can uh, detect as well as prove the absence of these runtime errors, essentially ensuring that the code that you've either generated uh, and integrated with other code is uh, very robust. It also does a very good job of determining uh, variable ranges and then propagating this through uh, the analysis. And as you can see in the, on the graphic on the right-hand side, uh, we're sticking to this color coding scheme that um, Nishat had shown before on the models. So we, in a, in a very similar fashion, apply this to the code as well, where we can identify those aspects of code that are reliable. We paint that in green. When we detect a problem, that's painted in, in red. Dead code, code that's unreachable is colored in gray. Code that's not proven to be safe is colored in orange. Now, we also support um, uh, code compliance checks for standards such as MISRA and JSF++, and these are colored in purple, as you see on the graphic. And then finally, one thing to point out is that, uh, again, we're keeping very accurate track of the variable ranges, and you see in that tooltip, uh, the variable ranges can be displayed very easily as well. And uh, we support languages such as C, C++, and Ada. Uh, we integrate with uh, Simulink so that you can run Polyspace directly from Simulink itself, and I'll show you a demonstration of that. So here's a quick example of how we prove the absence of runtime errors. So here's uh, some uh, source code uh, for, a, for a rather simple function, a function called new position. It has a couple of input parameters, sensor position one, sensor position two, and then there's some algorithmic um, content within that function itself. Now, one of the things you notice here is that everything is colored in green, indicating that polyspace, you know, using polyspace, we've actually proven uh, that this code is safe, is very reliable. Again, imagine if you're in a certification process where you have to do some code review, you can now take these color-coded results into that code review to show uh, you know, your peers, your, ma your, your manager, your certification authority uh, that the code is proven to be free of runtime errors. Uh, let's focus in on this one particular uh, uh, area where you, you might have some concern, and that is uh, where we're doing this divide operation. So in this particular case, if uh, x is equal to y, uh, clearly a divide by zero will occur. Now, in this particular case, we see that polyspace has colored this in green, indicating that the divide by zero will not happen. So you might be curious to know as to why that is the case. So let's, let's kind of understand why. So if we um, look at the variable range of x, uh, it turns out that x will always have the value 10 when you get to this line of code. If we look at the variable range of y, it turns out that the variable y will have the range between 11 and that rather large number. So as you can clearly tell, there is no overlap between the ranges of x and y. So x can never be equal to y, and therefore the divide by 0 will not happen. Now we're doing this exhaustively. So with polyspace, we're actually looking at the full range of that sense of position 1 and also the full range of sense of position 2. So mathematically, uh, we've been able to prove uh, that this code is indeed safe. Um, real quick to show you how we detect uh, runtime errors, here's a case where we've identified in red where a point of dereference is actually uh, out of bounds. Now, let me come back to some of the models that uh, Nishat was showing earlier. And in particular, let's take a look at this uh, fuel rate controller logic. And I want to actually show you a demonstration of how you can use polyspace to verify the code uh, for this control logic. So we're going to start with the, uh, the model. We're then going to generate uh, the code for this particular model. And then we, we will actually verify the generated code with polyspace. And again, I'll show you in, in demonstration form um, how we can do that. So if we could switch to my laptop. All right, so here's uh, that model that I showed you in the presentation form. Um, here it is again in Simulink. Uh, to generate code, very straightforward. We simply go into Tools, we go into Code Generation, and then we would do uh, Build Model or Control-B to generate the code. So I've already gone ahead and done that. Uh, the next step would be to verify that generated code with Polyspace. Again, very straightforward to do from Simulink. You go to Tools, you go to Polyspace, and um, you then pick uh, polyspace uh, for embedded coda, and uh, we can go ahead and verify the code. Now, in the interest of time, I'll, I've already gone ahead and, and completed that step. And uh, here's the polyspace results uh, for uh, my generated code. Let me zoom in a little bit so that you can see better here. So here's the, um, the generated code. It's in a file called sldvdemofuelsyslogic.c. 
And the interesting thing you see here is that it's colored in green, indicating that Polyspace has actually proven uh, that there is no runtime error in my generated code uh, for this particular uh, model. Uh, here are the, the various functions within that uh, generated code itself. Uh, let's go ahead and, and focus in on, on some, of the, um, uh, some of the checks that Polyspace has done on that generated code. Uh, in this particular case, why don't we take a look at this uh, out-of-bound array index that Polyspace is checking for. So again, let me zoom in just a little bit. You can see I've got, some, I've got a statement here in C uh, which involves uh, an array index access. And you can see with the message that Polyspace has provided me that we've actually proven that this particular array index is, uh, is correct. Right. Now let me get back to the presentation to um, go to the next phase of my demonstration. All right, so now we've con confirmed that the generated code is uh, reliable, safe from a runtime perspective. Uh, then the next step we might envision ourselves is that generated code has to get integrated with some other code. Uh, for example, driver code if we have uh, sensors that we're inter interfacing with, for example. And uh, once again, we need to ensure that this, this mix of generated code and handwritten code is safe and robust. Um, so that's what we'll do. Uh, as as a as as a as a next phase in terms of an integration uh, verification phase, where the uh, complete integrated code uh, will be verified with Polyspace. And in this particular scenario, one of the things we need to be concerned about is the interface from uh, my generated code to the the hand code, because obviously, if that interface is not well understood, uh, then there could be problems uh, in the handwritten code that are caused by uh, the variable ranges uh, that we use in the generated code. So let's go ahead and then switch back to uh, my, my other laptop to show you the demonstration of how we can use Polyspace for this purpose. All right, so here's uh, the, uh, the Polyspace uh, results uh, with the uh, integrated code having been run through. Uh, taking a closer look at uh, the Polyspace results there, you can see a couple of different functions that I'm using uh, to verify uh, from, from an integration perspective. There's my main.c, which is the main function. You can see that's colored in, in, in green, which is a good thing. Then you see a new function uh, or a new file called myfunc.c. This is the hand code. And what's interesting to me is that it's colored in red, indicating that there's actually a problem there. And then you also see the SLV demo fuelsys logic.c file, which is colored in green. That's the generated code. So let's take a closer look at, as to what's going on. So obviously, uh, the hand code that I've stitched together with my generator code has some sort of a uh, runtime error in it. So I can actually go directly to that runtime error. You can see here that uh, I've got some code that's highlighted in red. Uh, and it turns out that it looks like it's an uh, array index um, that uh, seems to be problematic, um, where the, the field mode state uh, that I'm, I'm grabbing from the generator code seems to be uh, producing a, a, a value that is causing a problem uh, in my hand code. So let's debug this a little bit. Uh, we see that uh, there's an informational message here that Polyspace has produced. Let's take a closer look at that. It says the array index is outside of its bounds. So I've declared an array in my hand code that has uh, a size of 3. In other words, uh, the range uh, for this array is 0, 1, and 2. But then uh, this computation that I'm performing on the index, which is based on the field mode state, I'm adding 2 to it. That causes an index value that is outside of the bounds. So for some reason, when I wrote this hand code, I guess I wasn't completely cognizant of the, the ranges uh, that could be produced by the generator code. And as a result of that, I now have a, uh, a problem in my hand code. So clearly, this is something that I, I would have to fix uh, before I would proceed uh, to the next phases of uh, my verification process. So with that, uh, let's get back into the presentation again. All right. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and hand this back to Nishant. OK. Uh, thank you so much, Jay. Um, so it does seem as if, uh, you know, going through this entire VNV thing uh, is necessary. That is on the model level as well as the code level, right? That's correct. That's correct. Um, it's very important to do the model level verification because you want to make sure that the model you've designed, you know, based on simulations and some of the other verification activities, that it's, you know, A, functionally correct, and then B, robust uh, and testable. But then once you do that, 
you want an easy way to generate code for your model. MathWorks lets you do that with uh, embedded code of products. Uh, and then, but once you get to that generated code, uh, it's not you know it's not sufficient to, to be done at that point. You've got to do some verification activities on on the code. Uh, the Polyspace product helps you do that, and then you can take it through the process of uh, integration test, and then finally through user acceptance. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, so um, a brief mention of uh, you know we we we've kept on saying this that these are some things our customers have been doing. And I uh, wanted to highlight a few examples on those four topics. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, please feel free to go through these uh, user stories, uh, like Bell Helicopter uh, designs its civilian tilt rotor. We have uh, some of the automotive uh, folks using uh, our products for uh, tracking designs with and requirement changes. Uh, also for finding this untested part of your design that's model coverage and using uh, formal verification. Um, these are again going to be linked off uh, this presentation and uh, this presentation should be available to you uh, in a couple of days.